Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. So good to be with you this morning. So good to be together. And um, man, how about this uh, Christmas tent? It's like we're in a Hallmark Christmas tree lot or something to worship the Lord together. Isaiah chapter 40 is where we are as we start this new series. But before we do that, uh, you, you often hear me bragging on the, the body of Christ in San Diego, the church with a capital C, all the churches coming together. You guys heard, we said several weeks ago that Foothills, I, I'm not, not Foothills, church came out of Foothills, Grove Church gave us this stage to use, which has just been such a blessing. And then thank you, Bruce. Uh, Bruce came and uh, built the bottom of it to, to facilitate it. But then um, if this week you went, where did the drummer go? Uh, the drum cage was given to us this week by Skyline Church. So we just want to thank Skyline Church. We want to thank Grove Church. And there, there's just such a friendship in the body of Christ that we, we just love. As things are challenging and tight and hard in these times, man, the church of Jesus is coming together. And man, I'm just proud to, to, to be a part of the larger church in San Diego, aren't you? So we're going to start a new series this morning entitled The Comfort of Christmas. The Comfort of Christmas. And I think that so many of us, when we come towards the Christmas season, you know, we think of the comfort it brings. Probably like me, many of you, I imagine had those times as a child where you'd lay on your back under the Christmas tree and stare up at the lights, look at the ornaments. Uh, oftentimes when I think of Christmas, I just start thinking, ah, I'm going to be able to, to, to get cozy in a comfortable chair, drink my hot apple cider, have the tree on one side, have a, a, a roaring fire to keep us warm in the frigid San Diego Arctic temperatures and, 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 and listen to some, some comforting Christmas music. I, I get excited about Christmas season because I'm thinking about all the different Christmas albums that are going to bring these nostalgic feelings. We had Josh Groban Christmas on a couple nights ago. You know, at this, this Christmas time, we're coming towards the holidays. I know I, I think about all the comfort food I'm going to eat at Thanksgiving as we're getting to the holidays. We're, we're hearing uh, of more challenging news, more lockdowns happening, saying, hey, you might not be able to celebrate the holidays with your loved ones. And, and there's all of these, these uh, COVID spikes going on. And, and what I want to tell you this Christmas is that the comfort of Christmas can't be taken away. Because the comfort of Christmas goes beyond circumstances. It goes beyond uh, atmosphere. The comfort of Christmas is a person. And that person's name is Jesus. And so as we dive into this Next several week series, we're going to dive into the heart of God and hopefully have fresh encounters with the true comfort of Christmas, our risen and reigning Messiah. So if you want to turn with me to Isaiah 40, that's where we're beginning. It's a messianic promise. And what does that mean? It's a, a Messiah is the ruling and reigning Savior of the world. And for hundreds of years before Jesus ever even came, the Old Testament prophets, these Jewish men and, and women of old would proclaim that there is coming one who would love the whole earth and who would be a Savior and set up an eternal kingdom. And I just want to remind you as we come into Christmas that that first Christmas happened as well in a perilous time. It wasn't this charming and nostalgic time where everything was peaceful. It came in a time where there was an oppressive government, the Roman Empire, who mercilessly destroyed anyone who opposed it and was oppressive and uh, harsh treatment. They were buddied up to uh, an unrighteous king in Israel. Israel is where the Messiah came, and his name was Herod the Great. And he actually ordered the, the, the massacre of, of every uh, boy child under two years old. It, it, was a, it was a harsh and perilous 
time into which that first Christmas was given. But let's look at Isaiah 40 this morning. It says this, comfort, comfort my people. We're talking about the comfort of Christmas and this messianic promise starts, this prophecy starts with comfort, comfort my people, says your God. I want to tell you today that God is speaking comfort over you. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Boy, we need more tender speaking in 2020 with all the harsh rhetoric. And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice calling In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. If you remember before Jesus came on the scene, that voice actually came calling. His name was John the Baptist. So hundreds of years before the prophet Isaiah is saying they'll they'll come one before the Messiah that's going to call out the desert. And this is exactly what John the Baptist did. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and the hill will made low. The rough ground shall become level and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people, I love that, and all people will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass and their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You have an enduring word from God here this morning that you can bank your life upon. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain, go tell it on a mountain, over the hills and everywhere. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout, lift it up, and do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with his mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart, and he gently leads those who have Young, I believe this Christmas, perhaps like never before in our lives, in our generation, we need the comfort of Christmas. I looked up that word comfort in the Webster's Dictionary. This is what it says, to give strength and hope to. I believe God wants to give you strength this morning. I believe he wants to give you hope. It says also to ease the grief or trouble of. I believe God is wanting to ease your grief and your trouble. But then I did a deeper search into that Hebrew word as we begin Isaiah 40 with not just comfort, but says comfort. Comfort, my people. God's wanting to make sure we know what's coming towards us, and it's comfort. And that word in Hebrew is nacham, nacham. And as you study what that word really means, it means to sigh. Everyone give me a, ah. You know, I haven't heard many people doing that this year in 2020. So often we sigh, or it says to to breathe strongly. (sighs) You know, when's the last time you felt like you could breathe a sigh of relief? I think many of us have felt like we're holding our breath through 2020. You know, we, we breathe a sigh of relief when we get through a hard time, but it seems like the hard times have kept coming. We can breathe deeply when we feel like all is at peace. And I believe that that is what what God wants. But here's the interesting thing about COVID, this COVID crisis, is it actually attacks our breath. It it, it affects our our respiration. And and, and so I I remember Steph and I had a friend that immediately got COVID at the very beginning of it. And we were constantly receiving updates on his breathing. And he was one of those that was initially uh, put on a respirator and, and we would be sent prayer requests. Pray that his oxygen level gets here. And, and so we're thinking constantly about breath. And I don't know about you, but you know, a, a, a couple weeks into COVID and I'm having to make all these decisions with the church and what are we gonna do? And I'm talking to all our different missionaries and they're experiencing all kinds of different challenges and lockdowns. And I started noticing my chest a little tight. And, and, and having a little harder time breathing. And then you start freaking out. Do I have COVID? 
And man, I gave my albiterol inhaler because I have a, a little asthma, man. I gave it a run for my money. Uh, and, and I found that many people were experiencing that. I even started seeing articles about uh, saying, hey, don't worry, you don't have COVID, you're just dealing with anxiety. Uh, and, and you have a shortness of breath. And, and, and I was experiencing that. And then, you know, different ones that actually did have this, had this thing. And then uh, by God's grace for me, that, that, that went away over, over time. But I, I noticed several weeks ago when just some more challenges arose and it was a, a harder time, I, I started struggling with getting sleep. And I, I, I was talking to one of my uh, friends, good lifelong friends, one of my college roommates. And, you know, he asked me how I could pray for me. I said, hey, man, I just haven't been sleeping well. And so he, you know, you know your, your friends that love you, they all of a sudden become your doctor. And he, he starts telling me all these recommendations. And one of his big ones was he goes, okay, Robert, no, you need to lie flat on the floor, start massaging your forehead, and then just focusing on taking deep breaths. You know, it really works. I encourage you, just lay down and massage your forehead. You might want to wait till you get home, but... Um, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if I'll get a little follicle stimulation doing that a little more, but uh, taking deep, deep breaths. And it, it's interesting because I'm just thinking about comfort and this, this idea uh, of breathing in deeply. And it made me dive in deeper into the scriptures because I started thinking about all the ways that God impacts and, and creates through his breath. You go back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. And it says this, the first time we, we see the, the mention of the Holy Spirit, in Genesis 1, 2, if we could put that verse up, it says this, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So God's hovering over the waters in creation. But when you look at that word for spirit, it's ruach. Ruach, that's the Hebrew word. And as you look at the direct translation of that word, it is this. Ruach is a wind or by resemblance, a breath. So even the Holy Spirit was known as a breath. Then you go to the next chapter, Follow me, because I'm going somewhere with this. The next chapter, God's going to create man. And how does he do it? It says, first, he forms him out of the dust. We, we used to have a drama that would take all over the world. And, and, and if you were playing God, you'd, you'd, you'd swoop down and you'd get this dirt and you'd, you'd start dribbling it down. And there was a guy laying here, but he was acting like he was asleep. And you'd throw down the dust, but the guy would come alive when you went as God and blew on him. It says this, and in Genesis 2.7, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. God, the Holy Spirit, who is like wind, who is breath, breathed himself and man comes alive. God created us through breath. And then you get to this interesting juncture in the New Testament because one of the messianic promises is I'm going to actually come and live with you. I'm going to be Emmanuel, God with you. And, and so in the New Testament, I want you to see this in John chapter 20. I want you to see how the Holy Spirit is actually given to his followers. It says this, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Now you have to understand, this is after the crucifixion. This is after Jesus died. And so all the disciples, they're in a time of panic and peril because they're thinking, our one that we thought was going to bring us comfort, he's dead. And so they're huddled together in the upper room, and all of a sudden, Jesus, boom, shows up. And he goes, peace be with you. And it says, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Why? Because he's actually showing them. They're pierced. Like, this is actually me. I'm, I was pierced on the cross and my side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed <sighs> on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This Christmas you need the comfort of God. 
but more than sitting in a comfy couch looking at a glistening tree, drinking some hot apple cider, listening to Josh Groban sing Oh Holy Night, looking at the presents and, and cuddling up, watching a Hallmark movie. You need, you need the breath of the Ruach of the Holy Spirit that created you, filling your inmost being moment by moment. This isn't a religion. This isn't a holiday. This is a relationship with the living God of the universe who wants to fill you moment by moment to never leave you alone, to breathe life and help and hope and joy into every fiber of your being. I'm about to get happy up here. It's time to slow down and breathe deeply of the breath of God. I was thinking about learning to breathe because we have to learn to breathe in the spiritual way and many times it's hard because Everything in the world is trying to take our breath away. Everything right now, it's more pressure. It's more intense. We're, we're in this atmosphere that tells us, no, don't breathe deeply. Be anxious. No, you can't, you can't do that. Look at all the fears around you. Look at all the anger around you. Look at all the paranoia around you. Look at what's going on. I was, I was thinking about when I was trying to learn to breathe in a different atmosphere, I tried to scuba dive. Now, I might be the only person that you've ever heard of that actually failed their scuba diving test. Like, I took a scuba diving course, and I failed. And I actually never passed. I, I am a failed scuba diver. Uh, I don't know how that makes you feel about me, but I, I, uh, here's, this, here's my story. I, didn't, I wasn't blessed like many of you. I didn't get to grow up in San Diego where you have the gorgeous Pacific Ocean that can learn to scuba dive in, in La Jolla shores. No, I grew up in Central Texas, and you had to scuba dive in murky Lake Travis. <sighs> lake Travis, where they're like sunken cars on the bottom of the lake, and they filled in an old town, and there's catfish the size of a Volkswagen, and scary. And, and so that's where they were teaching me. And, and the furthermore, the problem with Central Texas is that it's the allergy capital of the world. And so I would really struggle with allergies. Like there's pollen, there's mold, there's cedar. And so I would go and, 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 and just have these bad sinus infections. So if you've ever had a sinus infection and then experienced a different atmospheric pressure, it's not fun. I.e., have you ever had a sinus infection? Infection. Yeah, have you ever had a cold and gone on a plane? Not fun, right? It feels like someone put your head in a vice grip, right? They're like someone's putting drills in your ears. So imagine scuba diving. It's even more. So the time that I'm taking my scuba diving test, I have a sinus infection, and my scuba instructor and my little partner, they, sh they shimmy on down to the bottom, and I didn't want to be left because it's all murky, and they're monster catfish and all these things. And so I'm trying to get down there, but you know how you adjust your ears? You blow. Like if you've ever been in a deep part of a pool, you're like blowing. And so I was blowing so much because my ears were hurting so bad that by the time I got to the bottom, I was hyperventilating. <gasps> I couldn't catch my breath. And so what happened? In the end, I just shoot back up, and I just thought, you know what? The pain is too great. I don't want to learn to try to scuba dive. And, 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 and you know, it, that was a real bummer when we were in Hawaii a couple years ago on our sabbatical because I just loved being underwater and looking at all the fishies, but I couldn't stay. Like, I had to just keep shooting up because I hadn't learned to breathe in that other atmosphere. And I want you to think about this because sometimes our pain keeps us from learning to spiritually breathe and survive in this harsh atmosphere of the world. And so what do we do? We, we, we run away from, from the Lord. We, we go into all kinds of painkillers, so many Run to alcohol because the pain is too great. 
So many are, are running to, to, to pornography, to, to feed our brain. So many are running to food, and, and we're gluttonous. And uh, So many of us, man, if I, could just, if I could just keep my mind distracted and so we don't become a deep person, we just always stay plugged in. We just never stop. We never stop engaging on social media. We never stop with the news. We never stop. We just can't stop shopping. Just stop, 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 stop. And we miss the deep ruach of God. Because of our pain, I want to tell you that those painkillers will never satisfy you. We have to press in and say, no, I'm going to learn to breathe deep the breath of God. Here's, here's what I find is another problem is so many of us feel like, you know what, I don't think God wants to be that close to me. Like you hear this pray continually and you say, gosh, I, I, I feel ashamed. Like I don't know if God really, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sinner, I've, I'm sinful. Here, I'm going to give you four quick points to kind of finish off our sermon today. Please write these down. Point number one, it comes from this verse where we're looking at this messianic prophecy and it says, tell them, the hard years are over because their sin has been paid for. You know, the great message of Christmas is a Messiah came. And so you're not trying to work your way towards God. Instead, the Messiah came. Jesus came, the perfect one. You'll never be perfect. Jesus was perfect, and he took his sins upon his body. He took the sins of the world. He took yours and my sins upon his body. He was perfect. We are faultful. You'll never be perfect. He paid the price. And so, number one, breathe in. <sighs> and know that your sins are forgiven. Breathe in and know that God wants to be with you. He paid for your sin. It's not about you working your way to get to him. Here's what I've found. COVID has had almost all of us responding at times in ways that we didn't like, that were sinful, and then it gets us in this vicious cycle because then we're like, man, I got squeezed, and then I responded badly. And now God doesn't want to be with me, and so I run away, and I just, and then I feel worse and worse and worse. No, God's saying, breathe in and know that you're forgiven today. Uh, Jason, can you bring me that chair for a minute? I, I, one of the things that deeply impacted me in my early days, I was given a book, thank you so much, called Celebration of Discipline. And uh, in this book, Celebration of Discipline, it talked about spiritual breathing, this old Quaker exercise. That, and it goes way beyond that. Uh, monks for, for years have been doing this, this spiritual breathing exercise. And, and I want you to do it with me today where I learned reading about it that you sit, and, and the Bible says this, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So here's the thing. We sin, and then we feel so guilty, and we feel like we need to run away from God, but the great news is this. If you confess your sins, God says, yes, forgiven. I take them away from you, and you don't have to live with that guilt because the enemy wants us to live with guilt and shame. So here's what happened to me the other day. <clears throat> um, I don't know that we're doing the best with online school. Like, I, I don't know that the Herber family is like the prime example. And so sometimes, my, there's been a, I, I, I have to tell you, like there's been a couple occasions where my kids didn't do their homework. I know. And, and then the problem is I don't respond that well, right? I'm not like the prodigal son's father who's like, that's okay, son, here's a ring for your finger. And, a, and a, co a new coat for you. Here, have this Patagonia coat as you didn't do your homework. And let's go walk the land because I have a new inheritance. Enter into this. I will kill the fattened calf. Instead, you know, I, yeah, I haven't been responding like that, right? I, I more respond like the Mandalorian. And so... Um, and then, and then I'm feeling really bad about it. And then I'm like, how could I respond that way? I'm a Christian. Like, I'm, I, I teach on the prodigal son. I, I'm a pastor. I probably have to confess this to my church, which I am. And, uh, but here's what I've, I've learned to do is I learn to confess. I, I, I sit there and go, God, I'm so sorry for, for losing my temper and, and raising my voice and my child. And, and I confess that, I, and I confess it to my wife, and I confess it to my son. I'm so sorry. And, but here, here's what you do. 
I want, will you just do this with me right now? Because the Bible's all, so many times it talks about physical postures, like raise holy hands to the Lord, or bow before him, or clap your hands, all you people. But this is one of the things I do. I, I put my, sit straight like this, and I, I, I put my hands like this because I'm releasing the sin. So, Lord, I release my anger from this week. I release my, 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 my temper from this week. I remember when I was a, a young man getting a hold of this, one of the main things I was dealing with was just this, this battle with lust. I said, Lord, I release my lust, and I'd go, and I'd breathe out and just let it go. Just, will you just do that right now? Will you just, under your breath, just confess sin and just let it go? Just picture your hands dropping it. And just breathe out. Just let that go, the sin you've been holding on to. The anger, the, the judgment, the bitterness. Just let it, confess it and let it go. And then once you've done that, you turn over your hands. And I'd breathe in. I'd say, Holy Spirit, fill me in that place. Fill me, Holy Spirit, in the place where that sin was. Now fill me. We call this spiritual breathing. Just breathe in deep. And just say, Holy Spirit, fill me. And I remember the first time I was doing that as a young man. It was the first time that I actually felt the tangible presence of God. I'd heard about the presence of God, but I had never felt it. But I, it's like I felt this warmth. I felt this like electricity just gently coming over me. Actually, it actually alarmed me because I, I didn't know that you could feel something. I mean, it's all over the Bible, but I didn't know that you could actually feel the living God. We need to practice spiritual breathing. Confess your sins. At the end of every day, I try to confess my sins and then just ask the Holy Spirit to fill me in that place. Here you go. Thank you so much. Number two, I, we come to this portion that says this, every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. We're reminded by this text that there are mountains in our lives. There's these massive obstacles that we look at and they seem impossible. They're these rough places where the world just isn't as it should be. I mean, we started 2020 and all of a sudden there's a pandemic and we're hearing about people sick and then it results in, in, in economic problems. And so many in this church, you struggled financially or you've lost jobs and there's an uncertainty and, and a concern and a frustration. And then we had the, the racial pain that brought so much pain. And, and, and for some, when I'm talking about not being able to catch your breath, you're thoughts immediately went to the George Floyd situation and, and all of our hearts were, were, were broken by, by seeing what he went through. But some of you, I mean, that, there's an acute pain that, that's still really going on in your heart. And I look at this scripture about Messiah coming and I see that, that our, our physical pain, but our, our emotional pain and our societal pain, the ways we look at the earth and say like, that shouldn't be or that suffering, or that enmity, or that racism towards people, or that, the, that evil going on, that, all the people that are, are, are starving, or all the sickness that's just decimating people. And we look at this passage and we say, but someday, Messiah is coming, and he will bring down every high mountain, and he will smooth out every rugged place. And he will lift up those who are broken and hurting because the first time he came, he came as a little baby to enter into our suffering. But the second time he comes, he comes as a ruling king to make everything right. And so we can breathe in and know that the Lord is working. We can breathe in and understand that King Jesus will make all things new and all things right. And although you might be struggling, you might be, we just did a message two Sundays ago on suffering. Here's what you know because Messiah came. When Messiah came, he makes this verse 
true, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to your purposes. What we can do is breathe in and know, Lord, you're working for my good. In the midst of your hard work situation, in the midst of of your financial woes in 2020, in the midst of the brokenness of relationship, in the midst of your struggling and, and your lamenting and your grief and your pain. No, if you are following God, he is working for your good. This is a promise. God is working for your good. He is bringing down the high mountains. He is smoothing out the rough places. Number three. All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift up and do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. I don't know about you you, but it seems to me like the dark is getting darker. It seems like there's more violence. It seems like there's more enmity between people. It seems like there's more, especially for Christians, it seems like there's more persecution coming. And so sometimes we can, in this world, look at people who seem to be just living for themselves. They seem to be just following after their own cravings, their own lust, their own accumulation of wealth, their own pleasures, diving into all kinds of uh, sexual debauchery. And you look at them and it seems like they're prospering. And yet you look at Christians and you think it looks like things are just getting harder and harder. And so that's why I love this next point because we can breathe in and know that Messiah says he will reward those who are following him. You can breathe in and know that his recompense is in his hand. That though it looks for a moment like wickedness is advancing, that though it looks like for a moment that evil is prospering, the Bible says that all people are like grass, that they will wither, their glory like flowers will fade away, but Messiah will reward those who earnestly seek him. There will be a great reward in heaven. Even when you're persecuted, Messiah says rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. I want to tell you the ways that you're suffering for him in 2020. I want to tell you every time you return critique with love, every time you return harshness with gentleness, every time you reach out to serve someone else instead of hoarding for yourself, every time you're praying for a coworker even though they're harsh with you, every time you stand for Jesus and you shine his light and his love, there is a great reward for you. So you can breathe in and know. God sees how you're living, and God will reward you. Oh, it's good news. It's good news. Lastly, I love this. It says he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arms. That's you, by the way. And carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. One of my greatest like God memories, one of my greatest revelations of the God's defending and loving heart for me. It, it happened when I was an older child. I was playing soccer and you know, every once in a while you get in a, in a game, in a sporting game, where it, it, it gets a little rough, it gets a little out of hand, and there was a, a ref who wasn't the greatest of guys, and I don't know if you've ever had a moment where you got the breath knocked out of you, like it actually got knocked out 
of you, and you can't catch it. It's a very scary experience. And so I was a goalie, and there was a fast break, and so the forward was dribbling the ball. And, and you know, if I just stay in the goal, I'm not going to be able to block this massive goal. So you have to run towards the ball. And so I run, and I dive sideways and jump, and the guy misses the ball and just kicks me as hard as he can straight across my stomach, straight across my chest. And I'm on the ground. <gasps> <gasps> trying to gasp for air. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, just totally getting that air knocked out of you. It's actually a scary thing. Like, you, you feel like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make it. And so I'm, I'm on the ground, and, and I'm actually curled up, and, and the whole, my whole side of the field is looking. All the parents are yelling, and, and, and they're seeing kind of the, the horrified look in my eyes. And so they're yelling for the ref to stop the game. And this ref is just kind of a, just a harsh guy, and he's just not doing it. And so it, it, the game's just going on, and I, I'm getting scared because I really can't catch my breath. Now, it happened to be the soccer game where my parents, my parents were always at my games, but this one, they happened to be out of town, so they asked my grandfather to take me to the game. And for you to understand, my grandfather, think John Wayne. Uh, remember, I grew up in Texas. Uh, 6'5", 270. Then he wore massive cowboy boots, so I don't know how tall that made him. And then he wore a massive John Wayne cowboy hat. So imagine John Wayne supersized. That's my grandpa, right? We called him Pop. That's Pop on the side. So the parents are yelling at the ref. The ref's not doing anything. And so Pop, he looks out and sees me on the ground with a horrified look. And so he just runs into the middle of the field, in the middle of the game. And this little ref looks and he goes, get off the field. And my grandpa, with his massive hand, points at him and goes, that's my grandson. And, they, and the ref goes, okay, like this. My grandpa barrels out onto the field and comes down and he goes, are you okay, son? And he bends down and lifts me up and, and cradle carries me off the field. And I just went, ha. Ah. <laughs> As he carried me off, and, and later God would, would reveal to me, that's my heart for you, son. Because although today I'm telling you to practice breathing in, and I'm telling you to practice confessing your sins, and I'm, I'm telling you to let's, let's commune with the Ruach of God, and, and, and let's, let's focus moment by moment on that friendship, there are some times where you're just like, I can't move. The breath is knocked out of me. I'm down. I don't think I'm going to make it. And it's at that moment when shepherd God comes busting into your reality and says, though you can't do anything, I'm coming to swoop you up, son. I'm coming to lift you up, my daughter. And I'm coming to take you as a shepherd, like a little lamb in my arms, and you're going to be okay. That's the heart of God for you because some of you today, you're going through a divorce and you're like, I can't make it. Like, I don't, I've, I've had numerous people within this last month look at me in their situation, whether it's a financial situation, whether it's a family brokenness situation, whether it was a friendship betrayal situation. I had numerous people say, I can't make it. I don't know how I can make it. And I want to say, no, you can't. But shepherd is coming. Shepherd Father God is coming to lift you up in his arms and you're going to breathe again. He is the one who meets us in our darkest hour. Just hold on. He is coming to meet you in your time of need. That is who your God is. That is who Messiah is. His name is Jesus, which means the Lord saves you. Let me finish with this. This is what I've been doing this week, trying more and more. One of my favorite authors is Brennan Manning. He's now deceased. Brennan Manning called himself a failed Catholic priest. And he was very gifted, but man, he, he just continued to struggle with his depression and struggle with his addiction often with, with alcohol. But he had this unbelievable, unbelievable revelation of the grace and love of God, and so he he talk about his desire to just stay in constant communion with God, and, and what he learned in this 
in this understanding uh, of the monastic prayer life, of, of actually how, how can you pray continually? Well, let your prayers actually mirror the cadence of your respiration. And so he talked about how from ancient times, when, when people would be learning to pray, that they would learn, you know, the first word out of a child's mouth is daddy. And in Hebrew words, it was Abba. So he would say this, he would say, just as you're going out through the day, as you breathe in, just say Abba. Just say Abba as you breathe in. It totally matches the cadence of your breath. Abba. And then it'd say, then pray the prayer out of Song of Solomon as you exhale. I belong to you. Abba. I belong to you. Abba. I belong to you. Abba. I belong to you. It's a way that as naturally as it is for you to breathe moment by moment, you can start praying this central prayer because more than God wanting to answer some request for some finances or, 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 or some need you feel or breakthrough, the thing that God wants most from you and the thing that you need most from him is to be right with him moment by moment this Christmas season. Can you just do that with me? Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Living God wants to meet with you this Christmas. And as you meet with him, you'll find a comfort that transcends all human circumstances. Let's stand up.